like to introduce uh, Mr. Jamal Haider. Jamal Haider is a geologist, an IT specialist, a writer. He did his master degree at Nottingham University, UK, after graduating from Dhaka University in Bangladesh. He worked there as a deputy director in a government research organization. <clears throat> he has written and published a number of papers and reports, in and reports. In Australia, he completed a graduate diploma at the University of New South Wales and worked as an enterprise content management specialist in a government organization. His previous book, In the Name of the Lord, which you can see outside, has received critical acclaim. It is the history of knowledge, religion, and civilization from an Islamic perspective. It is divided into three parts, the ancient civilization, the Islamic age, and the modern age. His present book, The First Command, is about Muslim intellectualism and its history. Jamal will offer further details, inshallah, about this book. Ladies and gentlemen, Jamal Haydar. Uh, I think uh, Professor Trump has already touched a uh, lot of the things that I would be talking about ex tempo. I'll have to take the help of the notes and slides. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As salatu as salam wa sabdeel kareem. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here. I know many of you came directly from work after a tiring week, while others have sacrificed family time to be here, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Dr. Jan Ali for facilitating the launch, and thanks to our, the sponsors, Western Sydney University Islamic and Arabic Research League and Islamic Society. Uh, the first command is the history of Muslim intellectualism. Uh, after the time of the Prophet وسلم, Muslims became the best scholars and intellectuals in the world for centuries. Uh, this book deals with three questions. Number one is how and why the early Muslims became the intellectual leaders of the world. Uh, number two, how the contributions of Muslim scholars influenced global intellectualism, including the Renaissance. And number three, why Muslim intellectualism regressed to the levels that is witnessed today. A little background first. It was in 1977-78, uh, my first year in uni, a long time ago, uh, when I was madly pouring over Shakespeare, one play after another in my free time, that I incidentally came across a book titled Islamic History. I said, hmm, what is this? I had no idea. Uh, that was not my fault. They never taught anything about it in the schools. A thousand years of remarkable history gone, vanished, poof. But I was a voracious reader and I read the book. That was my first encounter with the Umayyads, the Basids, and the Ottomans. It was only after 2005 that I earnestly started to read about Islam and Islamic history. I needed to understand what it was about. At that time, it was a time of uh, volatility when everybody was talking of things that nobody really understood. Uh, so I read. 
I discovered a phenomenal amount of information. From 2005 and to up to now, I continue to read about this subject. It is a fascinating universe of its own. One of the most interesting aspects of it is Muslim intellectualism. Uh, Muslim scholars studying and progressing all different disciplines, religious disciplines like uh, tafsir, fiqh, hadith, theology, uh, and rational disciplines like science, social sciences, philosophy, literature, romance, and even comedy. Yes, even comedy. Uh, Nasruddin Hoja of the 13th century is a favorite of mine. Uh, he was the first international comic character of the world. There are many, many uh, witty anecdotes about him. Uh, he's my favorite, so I mention, mention him every, every chance I get. So there was a, uh, one day a sound came, uh, a shout came from uh, Nasruddin Hoja's house. A concerned neighbor, he went over to inquire what happened. And Nasruddin said, oh, don't worry. It was my jacket that fell down. And the neighbor said, oh, a jacket fell down? And it shouted like that, can a jacket shout? Nasruddin said, yes, of course it can shout, especially if you are in the jacket when it falls down. Uh, sorry for the regression, it's, but it shows the great variety of fields of, that Muslim scholars were involved in. Uh, their scholarship included all aspects of intellectualism, and their names uh, spread over the entire civilized globe. But now, it's all gone. Nobody remembers so much about uh, that incredible flowering of knowledge. What remains is a little bit here, a little bit there, like remnant ruins, which reminds me of Ozymandias, a sonnet by Percy B. Shelley. Uh, towards the end of the 18th century, the British were uncovering the mysteries of ancient Egypt from the archaeological findings in the desert, the pyramids, the sphinx, and similar discoveries. Uh, there was a sense of awe, what a huge empire it was, it had been for what, thousands of years, now all gone, except for some ruins lying in the forsaken desert. Shelley wrote the poet, poem uh, Ozymandias on that awe-inspiring theme, uh, Ozymandias being the Greek name for Ramses II. I found a similar sense of awe and loss when I started to understand the depth and the width of past Muslim intellectualism. Uh, I decided to write a book on that topic, The First Command. Uh, in book launches, uh, you may have seen authors read a part of the book, uh, but this being a chronologically uh, rearranged book, if I read just from a part, you wouldn't understand much of it. So I decided to take the help of slides. Now back to the slide. Okay, to answer the above questions, the book divides uh, Muslim inter, uh, intellectualism into six chronological periods of development and regression. The first is the uh, period of the Prophet. The Prophet taught Quran, Sunnah, Tafsir. Uh, Quran, the first command of the Quran is read, and hence the naming of the book. Uh, Sunnah uh, is the way of the Prophet, his sayings. The Tafsir is the interpretation of Quran or the exegesis of Quran. Uh, the Prophet established two types of schools, the Halakha and the Rehla. Halakha is the uh, is classroom in the mosque, which later on became uh, extensions, uh, ad, uh, uh, additional rooms. And at a later period, the rooms separated from uh, the mosque to become independent schools. Rela is a long distance education or distance education. The prophet used to send his companions to different places uh, and they would go teach the tribes how to study, how to teach them knowledge, and then they would come back. So uh, at the later stage, the Muslim scientists also used Rela, that is, they went for a reconnaissance survey, for example, botanists. They would go look for medicinal plants and then come back and write down their uh, uh, books or reports or whatever. Uh, at this first period, medicine and poetry was also studied. The second period is the period of the Rashidun Caliphs, uh, lasting for approximately 30 years. Uh, the Rashid Caliphs were Abu Bakr, Umar bin Khattab, uh, Usman bin Affan, Ali bin Abu Talib. Uh, 
Tafsir Fiqh jurisprudence. Uh, hadith started to develop as disciplines during this period. Theology, poetry, grammar, and geography were studied. The third period is the period of the early Muslim empires, the Umayyad, the Basid, Seljuks. Uh, this period, uh, towards the end, there was also uh, a number of uh, Persian dynasties. This period lasted for six centuries. Tafsir, Fiqh, Hadith were finalized. Theology, Sufi disciplines, philosophy flourished, but it was also the golden age of sciences and later on social sciences. Muslim scientists discovered discrete scientific subjects that had not existed before. The fourth period, uh, which I have na named the tri-military invasions, uh, due to infighting, Muslim empires disintegrated into smaller entities, kingdoms, and uh, emirates and princedoms. Weakened, they were subject to invasions. Uh, the three main invasions were Spanish Reconquista, uh, the Crusades, and the Mongol invasions. Uh, these led to utter devastation. Uh, towns of the towns uh, of Muslim uh, inhabitants uh, were destroyed completely. Uh, uh, millions killed, and uh, millions became refugees. Uh, scholars and institutions and libraries destroyed. That actually precipitated the scientific regression. The fifth period is the later Muslim empires and Renaissance. After the debacle, uh, the Muslims reasserted themselves and uh, they uh, again made big uh, empires. The Ottomans, Mughals, and Safavids, uh, they were the largest empires of their time. They had the best schooling. But they had one problem, they kept on regress regressing in sciences. Starting from the previous period, knowledge was transfer transferred from the occupied Muslim domains to Europe. Now, uh, what happened in that, uh, uh, that uh, the European scholars would come over to the Muslim lands, occupied Muslim lands, they would study there under the Muslims, they would translate their books and take those translated all the translated uh, knowledge back to Europe. Uh, this accumulation of knowledge kept on improving till it uh, led to the Renaissance. And as you know, the Renaissance ultimately did led to industrialization. The sixth period is the colonial period. As Muslims stagnated, Europe progressed and became powerful. They occupied large swathes of uh, the world turning them into colonies. Much of Muslim domains became European colonies. Ottomans remained independent till they uh, were dismembered after World War I. Uh, that's the sixth uh, intellectual period uh, in a nutshell. Uh, the seventh period, we are living in the seventh period. Foundation of Muslim intellectualism. The Muslim ulema, you know, the Imam, the Sheikhs, the Mufassirin, uh, the Muhaddid, uh, the Fuqaha, they laid the foundation of this initial intellectual outpouring. We know they established disciplines like Tafsir, Hadith, and Fiqh. Besides being the heart of the religion, these disciplines also led to massive intellectual endeavors. For example, uh, Tafsir at Tabari, the oldest extent Tafsir consists of 30 volumes. And each volume is of several hundred pages. So think of his time. They don't, didn't have laptops, they didn't have pens, they didn't have pencils, all, only quill, uh, ink pot, and papers. And he was writing hundreds of pages for each volume, 30 such volumes. That was uh, some undertaking. And his history, the Tariq al Tabari, is an even bigger work. Amazing. Hadith. Uh, we think that Hadith books were all written about 200 years after the Prophet. That is not exactly accurate. Hadith was practiced and taught by scholars from the time of the Prophet. They taught their students who taught their students. These scholars are known as the narrators of Hadith. Uh, some such schools had their own written list of Hadith. The Imams Bukhari and Muslim and others like them actually collected all these Hadith 
authenticated them using very stringent methodologies and wrote their books, their compilations. It was a coordinated effort of 200 years. It is, uh, its studies also include supporting disciplines of, uh, like principles of Hadith, Usul al-Hadith, and books that contain biographies of thousands of narrators. Affect our jurisprudence. As the Muslim empires grew, there was a need, to, uh, need for laws to govern the huge empires. This led to the development of many legal schools. Four dominated, ultimately, you know, the uh, Hanafi, the Maliki, the Shafi, and the Hanbali. They, each of these schools wrote a massive legal systems which were used to run empires and kingdoms for a thousand years. Theology, huge complicated works of opposing schools or complex debates. I, I'm not going to go into it, but you will find a material in the book, The First Command. Early Muslim science scholars. So it was the ulema who gave the early Muslims the ability to read, write, analyze, synthesize, and deduce. With such skills, Muslims were able to study other disciplines. The Quran, for example, encourages science. It has quite a number of scientific notions in it. This led the development of science scholars. Some examples are Al-Jabir, the father of chemistry. Before him, there was no empirical chemistry. Al-Khwarizmi, the founder of algebra, before him, the scholars of the world only knew geometry and uh, fundamental uh, mathematics, the subtraction, addition, things like that. Algebra gave Muslim scholars the ability to develop higher mathematics like trigonometry and ultimately leading to calculus. Uh, you have heard of sine, uh, trigonometric uh, functions like sine, cosine, tangent, etc., all developed by Muslims. Only sine they got from ancient Indian sages. Scholars like Al-Razi and even Sena changed what was ancient herbal remedies to what is modern medical treatment. They wrote massive medical books and treatises. They remained up to the 17th century the indisputable authority of medicine in the world. Muslims developed surgery and dentistry and developed medicines for specific ailments. And uh, Josh Satin uh, is the founder of uh, the discipline, history of science, he states, the most valuable of all, the most original, the most pregnant works were written in Arabic from the second half of the 8th to the end of the 11th century. Arabic was the scientific and most progressive language of mankind. During that period, anyone wishing to be well informed and up to date had to study Arabic. After that, he lists a number of scholars, uh, scientists. Uh, there, there are many such scholars. Uh, there is a chapter in the book listing uh, such scholars along with their short biographies and their books, and that is not an exhaustive list. Female scholars. The Muslim scholars were encouraged to get educated. The Muslim females, sorry, uh, were encouraged to get educated and attain knowledge by the Prophet. Soon, they became the most educated women in the world. They became not just scholars, but established big academic institutions and universities, the women. The achievement of Muslim women are remarkable. Comparatively, in the rest of the world, women started to become educated since the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Modern people, especially those who are interested in the history of female emancipation, must know more about this subject. Many modern scholars have acknowledged the contribution of early Muslims. Uh, in the book, there is a whole list with their comments. Here I will present just a few. Professor Robert Brifold, in his uh, book, The Making of Humanity, states, the death of our science to the Arabs or Muslims uh, does not consist in startling discoveries or revolutionary theories. Science owes a great deal more to the Arab culture. It owes its existence. So the existence of science is because of the Muslim scholars. And, and he continues, but for the Arab astronomy, 
there would have been no Copernicus and Newton. The historian's history of the world, the 25 volume encyclopedia says that Newton owes more to uh, Muslim scientists than an apple falling on his head. Uh, you, you must have uh, heard of the tale that Newton was sitting underneath an apple tree and an apple fell on his head and he started thinking of a gravity and attraction between masses. History and history of the world says that Newton was more to Muslim scientists than to an apple falling on his head. Dr. Dr. Tara Chand of India in December 1964, speaking in the Osmania University, said, <coughs> sorry, uh, for a thousand years, this civilization, the Muslim civilization, was the central light whose rays illumined the world. It was the mother of European culture. For men reared in this uh, civilization were the masters in Middle Ages at whose feet the Spaniards, the French, the English, the Italians, the Germans sat to learn philosophy, sciences, and math sciences of mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, physics, medicine, and industrial techniques. Their names were household names. Uh, Muslim contributions besides science. Like science, Muslim scholars have also made great contributions to the social sciences. Ibn Khaldun was the founder of sociology. He has uh, many uh, important pioneering contributions in historiography, demography, and economics. Many people consider him as the father of historiography as well. Uh, there are many uh, remarkable scholars who have great contributions in many other fields, including philosophy, literature, poetry, epic of romance, and humor. So we uh, talked about humor, uh, Nasruddin Hodja. Let's talk a bit about uh, poetry. Uh, the Caliph Abu Bakr, he was a poet. The Caliph Ali, he was a remarkable poet. And since then, uh, Muslims always produce very high standard of poets uh, and poetesses. The greatest epic poem ever written, the largest poem ever written, is the 11th century Shahnama by Fedosi. The most read poetry even today is by Jalaluddin Rumi of 13th century. His poems, uh, uh, a few years ago, it was found that his books of poems are sold most in the U USA. Okay, here is a very small poem, uh, part of a poem from Muslim Spain. Don't cross me off as fickle because a singing heart has, a single voice has captured my heart. One must be serious at times and lighthearted at other times. Like wood from which comes both the singer's lute and the warrior's bow. It's from Apology by Ibrahim Ibn Uthman of 12th century Cordoba, Spain. Philosophy, Muslims were the inheritors of Greek philosophy as well as Indian philosophy. The greatest philosophers of their time were Al-Kindi, Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, Al-Ghazali, Ibn Rushd. Ibn Rushd is known as Avarice in the West and his philosophical works on Aristotle established the foundation of rationalism in Europe. Europe inherited philosophy from the Muslims and f developed it further. Philosophical language is very complex because it was translated from difficult Greek to Arabic uh, to Latin and then to modern European languages. I mean, all the translation was done, but the nuances of the language remained back, uh, making it uh, difficult to read and understand. The time transcending philosophical conflict between uh, Ibn Sina, Avicenna, Ghazali, and Ibn Rushd or Averroes over more than two centuries is so fascinating. Uh, what happened was Ibn Sina wrote uh, a monotheistic version of the Neoplatonic uh, emanation scheme. And Ghazali actually critiqued that in his Tahafut uh, al Philosopha, or the incoherence of the philosophers. And Ibn Rushd, Averroes, critiqued the critic uh, in his Tahafut al Tahafut, the incoherence of the incoherence. Uh, so it was a battle fought over uh, uh, two centuries. It's very fascinating. You will find it in the book. 
and this is not in the book. Uh, there is something very interesting about the great philosopher Immanuel Kant. Uh, on his doctoral thesis dated 1755, his doctoral thesis, Immanuel Kant's doctoral thesis uh, dated 1755 is inscribed at the top of the title page, the Arabic verse, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. The Quran starts with the same verse. So how it got there, I don't know. The theory of evolution. Darwin was not the first to propose the theory of evolution. Neither was Lamarck or uh, his contemporaries. Long before him, Muslim scholars had proposed evolution. It was fine with them. God has set up the evolution process. Uh, you will get the details in the book. Uh, Professor John William Draper used to call that theory of uh, evolution as the Mohammedan theory of evolution. Sharia, English common law, and American constitution. The jury system of English code actually comes from the Sharia codes. Trial by jury, the action of debt, and a cease of novel decision all comes from the Sharia into the English common law. Uh, Professor John McDissey has got a work on that. The inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in the American constitution is influenced by similar points that is found in the Makassid al-Sharia. That is the intention of Sharia. Details in the, and, and reference in the book. During the medieval uh, age, uh, the European schools had two sets of curricula, uh, the quadrivium and the trivium. The quadrivium included arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Trivium included uh, grammar, rhetoric, uh, and logic for more advanced students. There was no philosophy or philosophical theology, ethics, or similar abstract disciplines during that time in Europe. Uh, there was no algebra, no chemistry, or any scientific disciplines. They all got that, all the, all the letter from the Muslims. Huge amount of translation of Muslim works were carried out in Spain, Sicily, and the Levant. Uh, translated books of Muslim authors were taught in European universities for centuries. King Roger II of uh, Sicily and Emperor Frederick II, who was also the king of Sicily, Italy, Germany, and uh, Jerusalem, were the two important rulers who eased the trans translation and uh, the transfer of Muslim knowledge to Italian and other European universities. There were others, but these two uh, were the front runner. Uh, I don't have it with me, the book, uh, uh, but if you see, go outside and see the cover image. That's actually the image of uh, uh, a world map that was sponsored by King Roger II of Sicily. And that map was actually done by a scholar named Muhammad Ali Drisi. So uh, Renaissance started from Spain and Sicily when they were under Muslim rule. Uh, generally, we understand that it started from uh, Italy but actually if, uh, all the knowledge went from Spain and Sicily to Italy and France and later on to the rest of Europe. So Renaissance started from Muslim Spain. Robert Brifold, social anthropologist, sergeant and novelist of 20th century UK states that it was under the influence of Moorish or Spanish Muslims a revival of culture and not in the 15th century that the real renaissance took place. Spain and not Italy was the cradle of rebirth of Europe. And it, it continues. But all these remarca remarkable works that the Muslims have done would come to an end. They, you know, I mentioned the fourth period when the invasions took place. Uh, so during that period, it all ended. So intellectual regression sets in. Multiple factors cause the regression of a civilization, intellectual and political conflicts, uh, sectarian conflicts, ethnic conflicts, tribal conflicts. We ha have all this in, in the Muslims. Uh, these in fightings cause disintegration of the empires into smaller entities, which led to the invasion like the Spanish in Conquista, the Crusades, and the Mongol invasions of the early empires. Uh, 
and the colonization of the latter empires. These devastations changed the mental makeup of the Muslims. They left the pursuit of knowledge. Poverty led to a subsistence economy, people simply passing their life in significant heedlessness. They could not afford general education, let alone uh, higher intellectual pursuits. The first command was forgotten. How many Muslims today read? Because the first command is read. How many Muslims read today? How many read with understanding? How many understand what the Muslims wrote a thousand years ago? Yes, those books are still extant, but most of us, if you read those books, we don't understand the level they were at. Our level is so down. How many are preparing the children to develop reading habits? For reading is not just knowing letters and alphabets. It comes from, it's a skill that comes from a reading habit. How many take children to libraries or give them a book as a gift? Not video games. Fortunately, Europe took over intellectualism where the Muslims had left off. Fortunately, because uh, if they hadn't, we would still be uh, riding horses. Well, that would have probably solved the uh, parking problem out there. <laughs> Uh, in current times, significant numbers of Muslim states have become uh, regressed in knowledge and at the same time become morally corrupt. What Muslims have lost is a way of life. Islam is not just a set of rituals like prayers, fasting, hajj, etc., but also a complete code of life. That way of life includes principles of knowledge, acquisition, justice, honesty, morality, etc. Uh, we have rituals and we have uh, principles. Both are mandatory. Professor Ascari of George Washington University studied 208 countries and territories to find which countries adhere most to the Islamic principles, values, and ideals. Now, I'm talking not about uh, talking about the rituals. We are talking about uh, uh, those values uh, uh, which concerns with the, uh, from the perspective of economics and governance and everything. Uh, so he made a list. Can, would anyone like to guess which was the uh, number one country? Which have, someone has said, uh, yes, right. Wonderful, you're up to date. <laughs> Yeah, so it's New Zealand, Luxembourg, Ireland, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, Canada. And as I read on, I found, I realized there's something I missed there. These are Islam, it's supposed to be Islamic values. Where are the Muslim countries? In the top 50 of the list from the 208, there were only two Muslim countries. 38 placed Malaysia and the 48 placed Kuwait. So, but that's, it's a very, very sad thing. It's time the Muslims started to think, to contemplate, and act at the very root of the problem. Thank you very much.